participants, please note you have been muted. If you have any queries or remarks, we request you all to type in the chat box. A very good morning to all and a hearty welcome to the international webinar on optical nanostructures in nature by Dr. Nonappa, docent MRSC, adjunct professor in soft matter microscopy, Department of Applied Physics, Aalto University, Finland, organized by the Department of Chemistry, St. Joseph Engineering College, Mangaluru. St. Joseph Engineering College, Mangaluru, in short, we call SJAC, is a premier institution, a hub for creativity and innovative ideas in engineering, was established in the year 2002 with an aim to educate youth in engineering and technology. SJAC is affiliated to VTU Belagavi and is recognized by All India Council for Technical Education, New Delhi. SJAC has been lighting up young minds over the past 19 years. The Department of Chemistry of SJAC exists from the day of the inception of the college in 2002. The chemistry department pledges itself in the broadest and the most liberal manner to encourage the advancement of all branches of engineering through its practically skilled education and service missions. The department carries out basic and applied research work through R&D Center, recognized by VTU Belagavi, and offers PhD degree in research areas such as crystallography, synthetic organic chemistry, electrochemistry, pharmaceutical chemistry, and analytical chemistry, etc. The center has been receiving research grants from various funding agencies such as DAE, BRNS, VTU, and VGST. Now, we will be beginning this webinar with a prayer. Prayer is one of the necessary wheels of the missionary of providence. We will be now playing a prayer song and praying to God to invoke the blessings on all of us. Feeling my grace, feeling my rage. You are my source of faith and strength. You are my path to destination, and I'm always connected to you. Nothing of me and everything of you. Leave me higher, leave me deeper, leave me beyond, leave me to. A warm welcome is complete with warm words. I now request Dr. K. Jyoti, Professor and Head, Department of Chemistry, to kindly welcome and introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. Nonappa. Good morning to everyone. Respected Director, Reverend Father Wilfred Prakash de Souza, Principal Dr. Rio de Souza, Resource Person Dr. Nonappa, Agent Professor, Department of Applied Physics, Alto University, Finland, Assistant Directors, HODs, Faculty Members, Participants, and my dear students. Welcome every morning with a smile. Look on the new day as another special gift from your creator, another golden opportunity to complete what you were unable to finish yesterday, be a self-starter. With these beautiful thoughts, we are proud and happy to start chemistry webinar series at SJC. 
we all are amid an extraordinary situation emerging out of the global pandemic and the consequent lockdown. With this unprecedented lockdown, everything has come to an abrupt halt and the academic world is not an exception. Because of the forced closure of educational institutions, the entire higher education system has been badly disturbed. In this situation, e-learning has emerged as the most effective option both for the students and teachers as well as the college or university management. Webinars are a highly interactive form of marketing to build relationships and spread useful knowledge. We are grateful to our college management for their untiring guidance, cooperation and generosity to organize this international webinar. It gives me great pleasure to welcome the resource person, Dr. Nonapa, docent MRSC, adjunct professor in soft matter microscopy, Department of Applied Physics, Alto University, Finland. I'm happy to introduce Dr. Nonapa to everyone present over here. Dr. Nonapa has completed his BSc from STM Ujre in the year 2001 and MSc Organic Chemistry from Bangalore University in the year 2003 in 2008, he obtained his PhD degree from IAC Bangalore in Organic Chemistry. In the year 2017, he obtained the title docent in soft matter microscopy from Alto University, Finland. Dr. Nonapa is having one postdoc from Department of Applied Physics, Alto University, Finland, and another from Department of Physics, University of Devaskila, Finland. Dr. Nonapa currently working as Associate Professor in Materials Science, Tampa University, Finland, Adjunct Professor, Department of Physics, Alto University, Finland, and Research Fellow, Department of Bioproducts and Biosystems, Alto University, Finland. Dr. Nonapa has published his work in more than 60 reputed journals, including Nature Communication, Angiochem, Jax, etc. Sir is a peer reviewer for 70 international journals. He has many memberships and positions of trust in various scientific bodies. Member, European Society of Biomaterials, member of Royal Society of Chemistry, affiliate member of Royal Society of Chemistry, member of American Chemical Society, member of Materials Research Society, guest editor, materials, editor, editorial board member, Frontiers in Chemistry. Dr. Nonapa has received many prestigious awards and honors. Web of Science Top 1% Reviewers for Crossfield 2019, Top 1% Reviewers for Materials Science 2018 in Poblons by Poblons Limited, Top 1% Reviewers for Chemistry 2018 by Poblons Limited, Excellent Review Award 2018, Professor Gajendra Gul. Gold Medal for Academic Excellence, Mangalore University, 2004. His key research areas are nanomaterials, colloids, supramolecular chemistry, molecular gels, cryogenic transmission, electron microscopy, and breast cancer research. We are indeed privileged to have a person of such wide experience and credentials. We profoundly thank you, sir, for consenting to be our resource person for the webinar and highly appreciate your virtual presence here with us today. We extend you a very warm welcome, sir. I welcome our beloved director, assistant directors, principal, HODs, faculty members, participants, and students to this webinar. Welcome to one and all present over here to this special webinar. Thank you. Over to Dr. Nonapa. Thank you, madam, and thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to give a webinar uh, at St. Joseph in Mangalore. Um, I'm really glad that this is the second webinar that I'm giving a college uh, which is active in my native place. 
before going to in detail, I would like to tell you that the title, which is optical nanostructure, it's also the other part way of telling it in more general is uh, it's a structural colors in nature. And this is exactly what I'm going to discuss you today. And before I go to discuss you, I would like to tell where I am located right now. And we are placed um, in Finland, especially the southern part of Finland, as you can see in the uh, red arrow here. And um, it is very close to the capital city, Helsinki, which is near the sea area. And our campus is presently located uh, about 10 kilometers from the capital city, and which is called Applied Physics, which is a building here. Once again, we are very close to the sea. And we have extreme weather conditions um, in the winter, especially. It can go up to minus 25 degrees Celsius. And uh, this winter, it has been a bit rare. And a little bit more about the university where I work. Uh, it's Alto University, um, which is actually not new, which is um, rather uh, old university. It's about 100 years old. But in 2010, three different institutes were combined together and renamed as an Alto University. Currently, there are 3,000 academic staff and 20,000 students, and students are mostly undergraduate and graduate students. And we have six different schools, and uh, each school has separate dean, and each school has separate departments. Many departments, I belong to the School of uh, Science and School of uh, Chemical Engineering. My work is mostly associated with the, uh, the microscopy. So I work at um, the nanomicroscopy center, which is specifically on uh, electron microscope. And we have one of the best microscope facilities uh, in Finland and the Nordic countries. And coming to the topic today, um, I would briefly go how and why living organisms and object in nature manipulate light and we discuss a little bit more about the colors in nature. And then I move on to a pigmented color with a specific example for selected molecules and polymers. Then we go into another way why the colors are produced in nature. That is a structural color, essentially optical nanostructures. And we discuss some of the uh, details, how the factors responsible for structural colors. And we go on to discuss a little bit more about photonic crystals and optical transparency. And this is intended to interdisciplinary audience, especially undergraduate and postgraduate level. Therefore, you don't need to have any background in many of this area. And it's highly simplified. So before starting, I would like to show you this uh, um, video. And this video, it shows you that um, this video, is a dynamic color change. We have a silicon wafer. We have a very thin film on a silicon wafer. And when exposed to a moisture, it displays this beautiful color. And this color can be erased just by blowing some hot air. And it can be regained. And this kind of dynamic color change is very fascinating. And these are not from pigment because the material we use is completely colorless. So this actually has fascinated us that to learn a little bit more what is color, how the colors are produced, the phenomena of color. And nature actually utilizes this kind of dynamic color change, especially uh, to overcome uh, some threat, defense, and adapt to the environment. And why color is important? Color helps us to remember certain objects. And it often sparks our emotion, and it also can influence some of our decisions, such as purchasing. And we often have always some favorite colors. And why we are able to uh, see a different colors in the objects or animals or any other uh, natural materials. Because human eye is capable of distinguish color in the visible portion of the spectrum. That means from uh, UV to uh, IR in between those range. Unfortunately, human eye cannot perceive ultraviolet or infrared rays. But we have to remember that there are certain organisms, bees and snakes, they can perceive uh, ultraviolet rays. And they have different anatomy because they have to adopt extreme conditions in the environment. In order to look at an object, uh, we are also able to see the differences in the brightness and intensity. 
That's why if there's an image in color, it has to be presented for us in a visible portion of the spectrum and also with a varying degree of brightness or intensity. This is because of the complex architecture of the human eye where we can have a very specialized photoreceptors and such as like uh, cones and rods. As you can see in the electron microscopy image here, we have uh, rod-like uh, receptors and we have cone-like receptors. And these cones are specialized to have red, green, or blue colors. And uh, interestingly, uh, we have to know that there are 12% of females who can also have more than three, that's uh, tetrachromy, like four uh, receptors. So they can see more colors than ordinary uh, people or rest 88%. And we have to remember that there is also color blindness. So it means that red and green color is the most common or blue and yellow colors. So therefore, sometimes we have to remember which color cannot be used when we present to a certain population. And living organisms manipulate color and manipulate light and their way they can generate colors and how they do it is one of these phenomena which is called absorption reflection scattering diffraction interference transmission or wave guiding and lensing and other important aspect of living materials and animals and which live under extraordinary uh, conditions and extreme conditions is that they are made up of all these color materials are made up of simple and ordinary materials. But the difference is that they have extraordinarily precise optical engineering. And they can utilize the limited resources in a very um, effective manner. It's highly efficient. And more importantly, many of these materials also have more than one function. So as I said that living organism can manipulate light and they manipulate light because they can they have certain molecules that can manipulate the interact with the light selectively in principle everything in nature absorbs light and but they absorb light at a specific wavelength and without very specific wavelength absorption there will be no color we cannot have vision there will be no heat no light derived energy or no biomass production such as for example photosynthesis and if you go to biomolecules, bio uh, for example, DNA, which can strongly absorb in the UV radiation between 240 to 275 nanometer, which is specifically due to the DNA bases, which have pi pi transition. Then we come to the proteins, which have peptide bonds, depending on the type of uh, amino acids it has made up of, they can absorb light between 180 to 280 nanometer. Once again, both proteins and uh, DNA fall in almost in the same region. Then we have uh, metallo complexes, such as, for example, hemes and carotenoids. They strongly absorb. They are pigmented molecules. Importantly, water molecules absorb pre preferentially in the IR light. And this is why we are able to uh, generate heat. And that's what's responsible to keep our body temperature and biological tissues. I told that DNA strongly absorbs um, in uh, UV region, but that is not good. It's bad for uh, any living organism because UV radiation can lead to DNA damage. It leads to a photo cross-linking of DNAs and proteins. Then how animals and we overcome this? And this is called as UV absorbing sacrificial molecular pigments, such as carotenoids and melanin. At the cellular level, proteins, nucleic acids, and other components, they actively contribute a very broad spectrum of absorption. And then we can go more than one type of molecules, and they will uh, allow us to achieve more than one functions by selectively absorbing um, uh, light at a specific wavelength. If you look at the molecular pigment, one example that I would like to give you before I go to the, the structural color, is the carotenoids. They have very high absorption coefficient and also interestingly, uh, they can function as a light harvesting system. They can also provide UV protection and they also result in biological coloration. One famous, exa one interesting example is flamingos. 
And for example, flamingos can lose their pink color if they don't have enough dietary supplement of these uh, pink shrimps. If they run out of this diet, their color will slowly fade. So these pigmented colors generally fades. But here is an example. It's a video taken from National Geography. What I show you is the octopus ink. And they sued the ink many of you might have seen. Octopus is famous for also the color changing and they can change multiple color. This is the octopus that can suit the ink and it's a combination of many things. And here is an example. It suits a thick smoke here. Interesting is that what is it made up of? And this is made up of uh, a complex polymer that what we call melanin. Melanin is also responsible for many other uh, uh, functions. And these are like produced and synthesized in melanosomes. And it's a major component in our skin and uh, also many other animals, sea animals like cephalopods and squids, microorganisms, retinas and bird feather. It is also, it, this is the same uh, polymer. Uh, we can have more than one type and nobody knows the exact composition so far of melanin. And that's why it's not possible to make a synthetic melanin with the exact composition yet. And this exhibit very broad absorption that covers wavelength from UV, UV to uh, visible light. This is, as I said, it's an universal absorbing pigment. It provides coloration. It provides also UV protection. By coloration means that it can also provide certain microorganism the ability to be more virulent. It can also increase the mechanical property of certain substances. And they have a huge number of chemical moieties that can bind, for example, to various metal. They help uh, to sequester uh, uh, metal ions in the water. What action happens in the insect, in this octopus ink, is that there is a very high fraction of melanin, which is combined with the mucus. And that creates a very thick smoke. And by thick smoke, it creates a big cloud so that uh, it can escape from the predators. So this is a defense mechanism that um, many of uh, cephalophores and squids um, adopt. And so it's not just about the color, it's also about um, uh, making, uh, uh, preventing yourself from uh, the predators and threat and extreme environment. Now, after these two examples, I would like to move to the actual topics, the structural color. In 2005, in the Scientific American, there was a very interesting article that why male birds are more colorful than female birds. And uh, in many um, uh, birds, if you can see, it's something like peacock, for example. The male birds are much more beautiful compared to females. And they have beautiful colors and display of colors. And they can also display colors at various events. And here, for example, peacock. And the peacock has this uh, peacock eye pattern. Interestingly, many years ago, there was also research conducted in ecology department in IASC. If you remove one of these eyes from one side, then it becomes asymmetric. And then this male peacock will fail to attract a female peacock. So this is a very interesting uh, phenomenon that how nature adopted color to also not just for um, defense, but also to attract its mates. And these are called structural colors. And structural colors are observed for one of these three reasons the phenomena such as interference, diffraction, or selective reflection of light from what we call as photonic structures. And we can see in our day-to-day -day life, many of these kind of structural colors. For example, if you take a compact disc, you can see the beautiful reflection of the colors from it. And soap bubble, which all of us know, and if you have seen the oil spillage, you can see a beautiful color pattern. And these days, it's also possible to make nail polish, which display more than one color, but it's a non-pigmented. And it's also likely that in future one day, we have much more beautiful uh, structured colors in our vehicles. And where these colors come from, these colors are, or patterns are called uh, structures which are responsible for these colors are 
photonic crystals. They are also called photonic band gap materials. And photonic crystals are periodic structures which are made up of a dielectric materials. I will explain about photonic crystal dielectric materials in the coming slides. And they exhibit some of the interesting property called band gap. And the band gap uh, forbidding the propagation of light of certain frequencies. So I told about the photonic crystals or photonic band gap materials. So what is photonics by itself is a branch of optics or a branch of anything that deals with the light and which control the photons. And yes, my dad, it's just like an analogy with the electronics, which depends on the electrons. So if you look at, for example, in conductor, semiconductor, and insulator, and we see a difference in the valency and conducting band. In more detail, if you look at here, the energy regions for which there is no electron state exist. So here, what we see in this case, and that results in what we call the band gap in uh, electronic material. In the same way in the photonics materials. So what happens in dielectrics? Because there is a certain energy gap, therefore the band below that energy, for example, for um, if you take uh, metals or insulators, semiconductors, then you have a energy gap which is below four electron volt, then the bands below this energy are completely filled. And of course, with the high a temperature, you can uh, excite electrons, which is of course, is not true for every materials. And such materials are dielectric or insulators. They're one and the same. What happens for dielectrics? They cannot absorb visible or NIR light. The reason is that the photon energy is not sufficient for transition from valency bond to the conduction band. So photon energy becomes sufficient when uh, you have, for example, high energy radiation, such as UV, which causes a very strong absorption. So in photonic crystals, the states of the light field is used in analogies to the states of the electrons. So in the same way, like, for example, the electrons cannot be described uh, with a plain de Broglie wave in a medium with a periodically varying electric potential. The optical plane waves are no solutions for uh, wave equation in medium with a periodically varying refractive index. So it's an analogy with the electrons. We can use the light here. And in analogy the plane de Broglie waves, we can generate a periodic structure. And instead of electric potential, in, we can say here the refractive index, which I will come to later. So what happens in the photonic crystals? So if you take a simple uh, example, like here is a pictorial, we have an object, we have light falling on that, and certain uh, light will be transmitted and some will be reflected. And how it happens, and it results in a phenomena called interference. What is interference? If we have now um, a medium which has one type, one uh, refractive index, then it, the light passes through another medium, which is a different refractive index. So that's a difference in the refractive index of one medium to another medium. So the light will uh, reflect from the boundaries, the upper and lower boundary of a film. If I have a water, oil, and air, Air as a uh, refract index of one, oil as uh, slightly uh, higher, and then water as 1.33. So the oil is in between water and air. So this will result when you have these two waves which are reflected, this will result what we call constructive. That means there's a phase change between the two waves. That means these two waves can combine. You result in a constructive interference that means you will see a color. They can also can cancel out. For example, if there is a no phase change, then you will see no color because they will not combine, which the resulting is that everything is canceled. So essentially, if you have an alternative low and high refractive index layers, 
you are able to generate a pattern that will give you a color. So if there are three different factors that depends, one is the refractive index of the medium, number of the layers, and the thickness of the layers. As I said that if I have a low refractive index, which means the air, it is one, and the higher refractive index medium, like water, so air is one, water is 1.33, it means that the light travels 1.33 uh, lower compared to, much slower in water compared to air. Then we see a phase change of around 180 degrees, then there's a perfect constructive interference. You don't have to be exactly, but the opposite, for example, now it is going from water to air, then we don't see a phase change because we are going from higher refractive index material to lower refractive index material. Then the phase change is zero, then we don't see a color. So the one way is, is to achieve this kind of interference pattern by regularly placing high and low, high and low, high and low refractive index materials. Here is an example uh, for, here is an example uh, of soap bubble and oil. And in soap bubble, we have a thin air, then we have film, which is of course the surfactant and water, and then we have air. So the light essentially goes through three different medium, low, high, low. And uh, oil bubbles or emulsion, it's also exactly the same. You have air and then your oil. Oil has a higher refractive index than water. So irrespective of there are three different material, the concept here is the same. Low, high, low, low, high, low. So the oil is lower than, no, higher than water. So essentially we see a similar color pattern. The other phenomena that uh, responsible is a diffraction. And diffraction is slightly different than interference, often it can be um, misunderstood. And this is essentially due to the um, bending of the light. It can be a certain defect or it can be, uh, for example, this is what happens in the, in the cloud uh, droplets. And we see scattering of the lights in the sky. And we can see a beautiful pattern. But the diffraction and then the interference have certain differences. As you can see, as you saw that diffract interference is combination of the two different wavefronts which eventually originate from the same source. But whereas diffraction is due to the interaction of light coming from different parts of the same wavefront. So this main difference that makes these two phenomena slightly different. So in order to achieve this, uh, whether the color coming from uh, interference or diffraction, uh, we have to uh, create structures or patterns which meet these two uh, criteria. So what are photonic crystals? And first I told this as the phenomena and this phenomena can happen in structures called photonic crystals. These are nothing but highly periodic structure. They can modulate um, a refractive index in one dimension, two dimension or three dimensions. Here is an, an example for a one dimensional periodic structure. What is one dimension? You have periodic structures or alternate layer only in one dimension. And for two dimensional, we have direction like this and also in this direction. And for three dimension, we have all three uh, dimensions, X, Y, Z, they are highly periodic in this. Therefore, these structures, depending on that, they can modulate the um, uh, light or refractive index in a given directions that leads to the structural color. Photon crystals, one dimension was already discovered in 1887 by Lord Rayleigh, but the two dimension and three dimension photonic crystals was first uh, theoretically proposed by Elie Ablonovich in 1987 in a PRL paper. And it is purely a theoretical paper. At the same time, there was also three dimensional photonic crystal which was um, experimentally and theoretically proposed by Sajiv John. So these two form the foundations of the photonic band gap materials, the modern uh, photonic band gap materials 
they're also the same uh, phenomena that what we see in you know, optical fiber, whether it's a silica optical fiber or a polymer optical fiber. So what about the little bit more detail? So they contain very periodic structure which can modulate the refractive index uh, in a given uh, dimension. So just like I showed about conductor, uh, conductors, semiconductors, and insulators, they also have forbidden regions. So it means that light can be uh, dispersed. And these are the photonic band gaps, as I already discussed. And it means that once the light is uh, trapped, you can modulate the light and you can also propagate the light. And this is an advantage, uh, such as I said, for example, in optical uh, fibers, where we can trap, manipulate, and propagate light for really long distance because they cannot, they are not able to dissipate the light. But nature utilizes some of the simple uh, molecules or materials to generate these kind of structures in a highly efficient manner. And if you look at the nature, irrespective of organism and material, they're all made up of either of these materials, either chitin, keratin, cellulose, or guanine is an exception for a molecular level photonic material because it has the highest refractive index of 1.83. And then we have reflectin is a protein, and there is an aragonite, is calcium carbonate in C cells that you can find, and a collagen in mostly in mammals. So it can be one or combination of uh, these materials that leads to the structures. So let's discuss some specific example for photonic structures in nature. And uh, I will discuss about one dimensional structure, I'll give three different examples for this. We go on to two dimensional photonic structures. We give a couple of more examples not discussing this uh, um, insect eyes. It's a two-dimensional crystal, but not really photonics. It's for uh, wetting. Then we discuss about three-dimensional photonic crystals and then helicoidal structures and some miscellaneous examples. One-dimensional photonic structures, one of the finest example is a hibiscus. And this particular uh, flower has a white and a purple patch here. And this is not pigmented color. And often we might think that it's a pigment, but surprisingly, it's not a pigmented color. What is it? We have a white patch with a red uh, pigment or reddish or uh, purple, depending on the orientation. And this is iridescence. Just I showed you in the very first slide of the color changing. You can uh, just rotate, take this petal, and so at a different angle, you will see a different color. And you can see a blue color, green color, and a yellow color, depending on the angle in which you can view this. And interestingly, it is visible to our eye because there are numerous flowers where these are not visible to human eye, but insect can recognize this. For example, this kind of color or iridescence uh, can also be seen in many tulips, but unfortunately, we are not able to see this until unless we separate those structures. And here is a little bit more detailed um, uh, explanation for this, what actually happens. If you take the scanning electron microscopy of the structure, if you look at the white patch and also the red patch, here is the white patch. What you see is the, the smooth structures here. And if you look at the, uh, this red patch, you already see the, a lot of different colors here, uh, if you look carefully. Then what you see is the nicely grated structure. These are diffraction gratings with a specific pattern and a very well defined uh, distance between these stripes. And now you can compare it. Now what it is shown here is that an epoxy is a polymer um, which was placed on this uh, colored petal and in the right side here in the B is uh, the same type of experiment done using a compact disc. And then that replica was taken. It is the SCM image of the replica. You see a nice grated pattern, which is similar to actually compact disc. And that's why you can see this color. And here it shows the, um, the view from uh, the 
this is the the top view it's the view from the side and you can compare for example here how the tulip by itself look like and you have nice beautiful pattern but within the pattern there are extremely smaller pattern that is here and this gives a uh, iridescent color and quite differently it is not following exactly same as for example compact disc in that case we could see the color that we observe in compact disc but slightly differently because it is a rounded structure not square or well-defined pattern in cd these are highly fabricated but this is fabricated in the nature using a different phenomena and the periodicity as i said that uh, it should be the order of wavelength it's about 29 micron so this uh, this is purely made up of uh, cells which are epidermal cells and why such colors are important the colors are important they have certain biological significance and one of them is called uh, is for pollinating and many other functions are unknown and in this particular paper in science they've also done what's called the behavior study what's behavior study is like it's called a differential conditioning like taking a uh, bumblebees which are known to pollinate these flowers and taking those who has never done the pollination these are called flower nave bumblebees and trying to experiment their ability to distinguish two similar colors one is iridescent one is non-iridescent and how they have done is just by preparing a synthetic iridescent flower so that has a similar pattern and then by taking a replica from a compact disc and then the disc can be also made colored using pigment for example so you have iridescent just by taking the compact disc gratings and a replica and then same replica can also be colored using a pigment so you have similar colors iridescent and non-iridescent and then what you do is that um, you give a reward for iridescent color which are not pigmented you give sucrose a sweet reward for the bumblebee and for non-iridescent disc you give a bitter reward that is came in a hemisulfate salt solution and which is sour and bitter so now the idea is that what happens if the bees visit you leave the bee in a bitter reward where it will go will it go uh, randomly to one place or will it recognize only iridescent colors not pigmented color and this was the example so what happened is that once they do this condition then sequentially they removed the bees and they developed the new bees and what they found 80 percent of them end up in all the time the iridescent color not pigmented color irrespective of the uh, reward so if you change the reward for example you also give the reward in the colored ones pigmented colored same as in the iridescent color they will always go to the iridescent color and this is very interesting because they have some unique ability uh, to use iridescence as a cue to pollinate so that is why the colors are useful. So this is, this kind of structures can be found in tulip and in tulip you can see much more beautiful grating, very similar to compact disc. And another example is in the insect field. It's called Japanese jewel beetle. Japanese jewel beetle has a beautiful green color when it is at rest. And then you see this um, nice purple uh, stripe and between the green and the purple stripe there is an orange color and if you turn it upside down you see the nice um, reddish orange pattern and interestingly if you take all these different colored places and take a cross section and look at a high resolution electron microscopy you don't see many differences here what you see in all cases there is a nice um, a patterned structure. These are one dimensional uh, layered structure. And there is an alternative layer of high and low electron density. And uh, the difference between these two, three, is that they have different number of layers. The number of layers are different. And also, they are not discrete. 
for example, you can see that um, they're very nicely observed. There is a nice uh, periodicity, but this periodicity is not very regular. And because it's not regular, they are able to modulate the light and the change the color if they want rapidly. So this shows that simply that by changing the same object here, and I think this is made up of melanin, and uh, they can uh, chitin and melanin. So they have different refractive index, so they have different, different electron density, and just by the thickness and the number of layer, you can change the color using exactly the same material. So this saves a lot of energy, resources, and time for materials. Another interesting thing is that morpho wings, they have very high reflectivity and with a selective wavelength of light. And unlike many other objects like a flower that I discussed, they have this color visible in all angles. So not like in a specific angle. And you can also see there is a difference in the color if you take a different types of uh, morpho uh, butterflies. So how to explain this pattern or differences in the color, ability to see, and the, and the transparency? A simple multilayer like I showed for Japanese jewel beetle is explain, can explain like I, we have high reflectivity and why there is a uniform color and variation of color. Only reflectivity can be explained, but we cannot explain two or three, which means that uniform coloration or variation of color among species. And if you look at the trans, uh, high resolution electron microscopy of this cross section of the wings, what you see is that they have some specific pattern and this kind of alternate pattern and these um, alternate patterns, which are like, are not having two different material. Instead, what they have is the air cavity. And that is why it is, uh, you can have very wide range of uh, very broad angle vision of color for morpho butterflies. And the only difference here is the size and the number of these uh, grated layers. And this as simple as that. Another interesting example that we can see is uh, in the fish and beetles. And these are examples for physiologically controlled color. And it means that it has nothing to do with the well ordered, uh, it has to do with the well ordered structure, but it's not a permanent structure. A structure that, depending on the environment, the animals can excrete certain body fluid that will modulate the color, essentially the refractive index. And in both cases, in the fish and beetle, what they have, you have a layer of guanine crystals, the molecular level building block, which forms a nice microcrystals. And alternative layer of guanine crystal and cytoplasm. Now guanine has 1.83 refractive index, where cytoplasm is close to water around 1.4. And so this alternative la layer, when, for example, this beetle was attacked by a predator, it or you touch it, you will see the color change immediately to red within a few seconds. This is because it is able to excrete some body fluid that will fill this cavity or change the refractive index that eventually change the color of this object. This is a dynamic and physiologically controlled color. So what we have seen is one dimensional photonic materials, which can come in a simple diffraction gratings, layered structure or this graded pattern. So then what about two-dimensional photonic structure? Two-dimensional photonic structures are not very common. And uh, generally they are used for some other uh, uh, functions such as wetting and superhydrophobicity, like in uh, moth or butterflies eyes. But there are a few examples. One of the example is uh, this uh, sea mouse, which was identified in 2001. And the sea mouse has a beautiful uh, color pattern. And uh, this color pattern can be visible. And you can also see, depending on the angle, different colors. It can be, when you see from one angle, it can be bright red or greenish. And the reason for this is that it has a two-dimensional photonic crystals. And these fibers, if you take the cross-section of this, you can see 
very nice uh, hollow cylindrical structures arranged in a two dimensional pattern here. And what they're made up of, they're made up of again, uh, simple building blocks such as, for example, uh, chitin. And if you take one fiber of that one hair, and then you look at, uh, count the number of these hollow cylinders, you can see that in the, at the center, there are big, and as you move to the, towards the edge, you start to see the size decreases. And this is made up of chitin, alpha chitin, which has a refract index of 1.4. And then what you have at the center, these are a hollow. So the, there is a difference in the refractive index between um, uh, chitin and then the air. So they're able to trap and propagate the light and also modulate the refractive index in two dimensions. So it's both, both X and Y. In the previously we had only in one dimension layered structures, but now these are in a, both the directions are used for patterning these kind of biological structures. And another example that I saw in the beginning is peacock feather. Peacock feather is even more interesting. If you take, for example, the stem, here is the stem, the main structure, and then you have the, the branching from the stem are called bobs, and the small hairy structures are called barbules. Now, if you want to look at the green and brown color, here, for example, is a scanning electron microscope is uh, showing the green color responsible structure. And here, the structure they're responsible for brown color. And what is the difference between this? So it has a core of about three micrometer, yeah? And the barbules contains array of two dimensional array uh, of these rod-like structures. And these rod-like structures are arranged in green as a square lattice, whereas in brown, it is a rectangular uh, lattice. So it's exactly the same material, but only the difference is the uh, lattice and the way they are arranged. So that can generate different color. And this is made up of uh, melanin. These rods are made up of melanin, but they're interconnected using uh, ker keratin. So what you see is these are the voids and the rods in between, and the rods create a beautiful uh, pattern of square uh, two-dimensional crystals or a rectangularly arranged two-dimensional crystals. And exactly the same material, same size, but only slightly they differ in each color, it slightly differ in the lattice pattern. One other fascinating example is bird of paradise. Uh, you might have seen this, uh, if you have seen David Atterbur's uh, Planet Earth videos. And this bird of paradise has this uh, nice uh, dancing moose, which is called ballerina dance. And if you observe carefully here in this dance, the most important is that the structure of color that observed the pattern that arises here. It is a beautiful shiny, silver shiny black feather, but when it starts to dance and attract a female, then you can see the color pattern appear here and also behind this head. And here is the female. The female bird is a dull brown color and it has not evolved anything much in thousands of years. But whereas the male has adopted a beautiful structural color. And what are these colors made up of? And this is very interesting because it shows a three dimensional, three directional reflection. The color can change nicely depending on the angle that view. And these colors, if you take now the silver-like uh, feathers, and also if you take a look at this greenish, uh, shiny colors, you see they are made up of similar materials or exactly same uh, melanin, uh, which I discussed, for example, octopus ink, where they're simply polymer. But here they are arranged into very well organized structure of certain size. And in this case, for this, it's about 250 nanometer, and it's a, they form nice layers, two dimensional layers, and the spacing between the layer is about 400 nanometer. And now what is the difference between these two colors? Here, they're slightly different because the size of this uh, uh, particle, melanin particle is smaller. At the same time, the distance is almost half that of 
uh, the silver color. So just by tuning both the peacock feather and this, the size and the spacing between these dots, you can now modulate the light and create different colors. And most important that these colors um, are very stable. Unlike pigmented color, if there is no dietary segment or it can undergo photo bleaching, these colors are stable. They can stay stable even forever because it's purely based on the material. Only once the material decomposes, this color will disappear. Otherwise, the color will retain. So there are beautiful melanins that also help to filter and generate and uh, separate certain colors. And how it modulates this color is still uh, not yet known exactly. It's able to generate so many different colors just with a span of time. We go on now a little bit about 3D photonic crystals as the next step. And uh, as I said, then for 2D and one dimensional, especially for one dimensional, there is a huge number of examples. I'm showing only limited number of examples just as a representative ones. 3D photonic crystals are found largely in beetles. And many beetles generally they display shiny colors and which you can see, you cannot see fully colored uh, beetles in the night, for example. But there are certain beetles which has a uniform uh, metallic color. When you see from any direction, you see this uniform color. And these are colors which are very similar to, for example, opals. And this color is due to the presence of certain structures on these small scales. And these scales are present about a millimeter in size. They are present in this hemispherical body of these uh, beetles. So what is it made up of? If you take a cross section of these uh, small patches, what you see is a three-dimensional organization of these uh, spherical uh, nanostructures here. And the lattice constant of this will approach, for example, the wavelength of light. If you take a reflectance spectra, then you can see that it nicely matches and it's around 550 nanometer. So it is very common that you can see this kind of structures in opals and many um, other structures in the nature and insect follow exactly the same principle. Another beautiful example is uh, uh, butterflies. This particular butterfly has many different color here. The black, green, the red patch. And the large green color is always uh, dominated in the, the four wings. And then you have hind wings with the red patches here. And if you take now in the cross section of this, look at the uh, electron microscopy, you can see that the colors are very similar, for example, opals. And there are two different structures now you see here. One is a one, these are grated structures, which are in, in between these two grated structure, what we have is a three-dimensional gyroid-like structure, a very complex network like this. And these are made up of chitin, which are filled with 30 to 40 percent of this. And interestingly, it's very important to know that in many beetles, and uh, we don't have, for example, simple cubic uh, type of structures. I mean, like in uh, butterflies, we don't have a simple cubic structures very complex gyroid type structures. And in beetles, you can see cubic structures, as I shown in the previous example before this uh, butterfly. But in butterflies, you see very complex gyroid structures. So this is very interesting that these two cannot have similar structures, but they can display similar colors also. And there is something has to do with the evolution and the uh, um, uh, maybe there are structures which has not been identified yet, but it's very interesting for those who study evolution and the uh, color and the significant. It can also be so that, for example, uh, to create a gyroid-like structure requires much more energy or much more uh, efficient construction of the structures. 
whereas beetles may not be able to construct them in the same way as, for example, butterflies. So what does it do? And this color change is very interesting because this uh, they can uh, escape from predators because of this, because they can quickly adopt uh, this green color, which can match, for example, of green leaves. And they can change the color uh, at any time. This allows them a quick camouflage, which means that color range. So the final uh, part is the miscellaneous structures. One of them is the helicoid structures and a polarized vision. We cannot have polarized vision, but many uh, insects can selectively perceive, navigate, and communicate the one type of circularly polarized light. And this is um, uh, due to the structures which are not uh, highly periodic, as I've shown in the previous example. This is totally a different class called a helicoid structure. And the helical structures can form a very beautiful angle dependent reflection and they can selectively visualize one type of polarized light and an example here is a beetle this has a shiny metallic uh, color and it can selectively reflect left circularly polarized light and now here i saw is the under a normal it contains the both right and left circular polarized light shined on the beetle, then you see this color. Now, if you block left circularly polarized light from uh, the beetle, then it will lose its color. So this is uh, rather interesting for developing many uh, materials which can selectively, uh, we can make uh, selective vision of polarized light. So it is because of the presence of uh, some of the chiral and helical structures that are generally made up of either chitin or um, cellulose, uh, which are rod-like cellulose particles. And they arranged in this kind of pattern, which, has, which undergoes the helical pattern. It's a normal line here, and this is going in a helical pattern. That is a layered structure. And as you can see, it has a certain um, um pattern this pattern you can, can say that the pitching so this pitch height determines the color that you can see and this is not only in the insect but you can see in many fruits because fruits are essentially made up of many of these uh, are made up of cellulose if you look at this color this is not pigmented color that's why you can store this fruit for thousand years the color will not fade and if you take the cross section, you can look at the SCM image, then you can see this helicoid structures, nice day range of cellulose. More detailed example is here. This is a fruit called polia condensata. This has been this is used, for example, as a decoration, decorative material, because it will never lose its color. And again, it's not because of pigment, it's again because of the cellulose structures, which are arranged in a helical, helical pattern. And now you can calculate the color, why it gives, for example, shiny color, blue coloration, because as I said, it depends on the pitch height, like how many layers or distance it takes to complete one full turn or 360 degree. And in this case, the pitch length is P is about 290 nanometer. Now there's an equation where you can substitute this value and you get the wavelength around 450 nanometer. That 450 nanometer correspond to the same color in the spectrum of the visible spectrum of. So uh, interestingly, this is very interesting because it's a high reflectivity and it's a record that there's no other biological molecule that shows uh, structure that shows so much of reflectivity. And a combination of uh, diffraction and interference can also be found. This is a two-dimensional, again, material, not three-dimensional, but rather different from any other category, the uh, mother of pearl. You can see beautiful, but very diffuse color. Now, if you look at the surface of this, you will see this kind of uh, not very well patterned grooves. And then if you go on, take a cross section of this, you see even smaller structure of calcium carbonate, which have about 5% other organic polymer, like uh, maybe chitin 
or some proteins and which are between these uh, uh, crystals. So one of them result in what we call multi-layered interference. The other one gives a diffraction. A combination of diffraction and interference gives you this diffuse color. And finally, what we can discuss is not everything is interesting when it's colored. And color is important, but also it requires a lot of time and it also takes a lot of uh, materials and energy from the organism to create. There are certain organisms that can also have uh, non-color or bright colors. They scatter light or they scatter white light. But to generate white light, it requires some effort. It's also not easy. And uh, it's difficult because there should be a uniform, um, they have to reflect the light in the same efficiency. And these are some rare examples of beetles. And such a uh, ability is not uh, possible by many organisms. So one of the examples is a special case here is uh, butterflies. You can see that they have nice white light, um, white coloration, bright white coloration. And this is because of the pigment that they have. And these pigments are called uh, terines, which are different chemical components, which result in certain number of uh, pigments that selectively absorb certain light. And for example, if you take leukoterine, it can absorb in uh, UV wavelengths. And this one, because of the higher conjugation, more functional group, this can absorb at 500 nanometer. And here is the same, two different um, butterflies. The one is the white, bright uh, coloration. The other one has a multiple color. And here there is a black patch in this white wing. Now, if you take the white portion of this electron microscopy, you look, look at these stripes and you look even higher magnification of this, you see nice this pattern, the pattern you can see that ellipsoidal uh, objects. They are made up of these terrain pigments, which self-assemble into nanostructures. And if you take the black patch now, the D, which shows you the SM image, it's not color, it's a black color, but there are no this kind of ellipsoidal patches. Same holds true for also this particular species, where it's color, you take any portion of this, you don't see these ellipsoidal structures. So it eventually adds to deal with this kind of nanostructures that helps you to have a very bright coloration. And in this case, um, it is due to multiple scattering and uh, it is essentially made up of very low refractive index materials. And another important phenomena why you can see white uh, coloration is because if you take the structure scanning electron microscopy of this, you see highly anisotropic, means not spherical uh, structures. These kind of small structures, these structures, if you look even more further, you see highly disordered structure. The disordered structures are uh, the one which are responsible for such a, um, a bright uh, light coloration. Yes. And a little bit more, um, the disorder, uh, wow disorder helps is that uh, it helps us to avoid any spatial correlation. It fills the space, but there is a lot of void in between them. And you can create this kind of structure simply by following this principle. And uh, this, this is why many insects are able to do this. And we can actually uh, change the, for example, if you have highly transparent material where complete light transfers, you can change, for example, the uh, order in that and it can turn bright. And such examples are known in literature. So not everything is colored, not everything is white, but there are also uh, transparent materials and that's called biological transparency. And biological transparency is uh, mostly seen in objects which are present in the sea or in the water. Because for that to happen, you have to have materials where the refractive index will match close to that of water so that it is, these are invisible. And uh, the 
but there are challenges, right? The challenge is that if you want to have a complete transparency, the entire body has to be transparent. Only then it is invisible to the predators. And except the eyes, if you see many of the transparent animals, only the eye is not transparent. That's of course not possible. So, but biological transparency is also a challenge because they want to avoid um, uh, the predators, but they can lose their transparency very quickly. Here is, for example, a type of shrimp, which is highly transparent. But if you take it to a, add a very small change, like parts per trillion of salt, then it loses its transparency and it becomes opaque. Immediately it will adopt and it will become opaque and the predator can easily identify. So if, if you slightly change a one or two degrees Celsius, the transparency from 40% to 0%, it will change rapidly. And this is not good. So this is also difficult to maintain. So what they do in such a stream, what they do, they do some behavior adaptation. That means that they find a way to overcome this. One way to overcome this is that to go to a place where there are like not much change in the salinity or temperature. It's always true that the surface water is highly sensitive to salinity and temperature. You go deep uh, water, then you have lesser possibility of change in this. So they have adopted this kind of behavior adaptation. So I would like to conclude uh, by saying that we have seen uh, in this webinar, I tried to go through, uh, cover uh, many topics, but uh, only idea is that nature can modulate light, nature can interact with the light and they can manipulate light. And we can find many examples for structures like one dimension, two dimension, three dimension structures. There are some miscellaneous structures that are example uh, that uh, leads to what we call as uh, polarized vision and then the scattering and the transparent structures. And I hope that uh, many of you now start looking at structure and see, oh, is it a structural color or pigmented color? And uh, I'll be very happy if you get inspired by some of these examples. And I'll be happy to answer if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for inspiring us with the wonderful talk and beautiful presentation. The forum is now open for questions. I request the participants to kindly type their questions in the chat box. We have already received a few questions, which I'll be raising now. Yes, for sure. Uh, so the first question uh, is from Krishna Prabha M. Uh, what are the precautions taken while taking micrographs of photonic structures present on creatures? Yeah, uh, these are very delicate. Uh, so there are several ways to take this um, because many of these structures, if it's one dimension, generally they take a replica. Replica means like you go to the polymer and take out and use that as a you know, indirect evidence to propose the structure. And other structures are very delicate. They are embedded in resin and then you microtomies make a, uh, Actually, this was the topic that I gave webinar two weeks ago in St. Elosis College, uh, various ways to prepare samples. So uh, you microtome it and make extremely small slice. And some structures, for example, peacock feather is very challenging. And uh, then you also have to process it, process it like, uh, uh, for example, subject it to a process called a critical point drying or some other way so that there is not much water content in the sample. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Another question, sir, raised by Dr. Vincent Krasta. Uh, mm -hmm. There are two questions, sir, actually. Uh, when Absolutely. you expose these photonic materials to electron microscope, uh, do they change mm -hmm. their properties? 
Uh, yeah, no, electron microscope is only to see what is what type of structures are there. And generally, as they, any sample you deal with the electron microscope, they undergo beam damage. It's a common phenomenon. And uh, for example, if you are taking scanning electron microscope, you anyway treat the samples. And you treat in such a way that um, they are treated with extremely thin coated uh, mm -hmm. gold palladium. But if you want to do transmission electron microscopy, they have to be very thin and they're sliced and they undergo beam damage. Of course, there are way to overcome this using low voltage. And uh, then there is also uh, one way if organic materials in transmission electron microscopy are not, uh, they do not have eye contrast, then we have to stain them. And it's a method called low dose. It means that number of electrons over uh, the per particular area can be controlled. This way we can take certain precaution to prevent the damage. They generally undergo damage, but it depends how long you expose it, how powerful is the, is the electron beam, and the conditions you do it. Generally, it can be done at low temperature. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, second question is, sir, what are the applications of photonic crystals such as butterflies, other insects, uh, which you have explained? Yeah. So there are numerous, uh, actually, um, what I've shown, for example, one way is that if you look at um, uh, the whole way that we communicate is because of uh, all this knowledge, right, the optical fibers which essentially what optical fiber has is the way we communicate is uh, using the signals and uh, propagating the light or uh, any sound signals, which utilizes low and high refractive index material. The optical fibers has the core high refractive index and in the cladding as a low refractive index. It works from a different phenomena called total internal reflection. That way you can trap and propagate light for thousands of miles. And that is for silica. And for, for example, for uh, butterflies and all, it's more about artistic. And you can also use certain stimuli, like, you know, it's called stimuli responsive materials. For example, they respond to heat and color change. So you can make devices called optical devices. And we can also have a, a thermal sensors or like even uh, they can sense, for example, change in the certain pH of the body fluid. So you can have a biomedical application where you can just have a naked eye sensors, which is color changed and touch sensors where the color is changed. So there are many applications. This is very well researched. In fact, this is not my area uh, uh, of application of material. This is the only course I was teaching. I become interested because some of our own ex uh, experience recently uh, if needed uh, you can find the structural colors and application there are a huge number of literature there are many groups works around the world okay sir thank you uh, this is another question sir from dr k jyoti can we synthesize these natural nanostructures and get the same effect as that of biomaterials yes um you can make many of them um and in fact, there was a paper called uh, synthetic uh, melanin, and you make a polymerized uh, molecule and then make the nanostructures and assemble them using layer by layer assembly. Or the other way of doing is the lithography. So you can take, because you don't have to have any pigment, right? You just need a structure. So it's just, you can take simple PDMS, or any other material, you can do a lithography and a pattern the structure, and you can get the color. It's, it's, uh, there are two ways. Uh, also, self assembly is a method, and second one is uh, a lithography. Okay, sir. So thank you. Uh, and, so this... uh, sorry, I would like to continue. There is one more method called uh, templating. It means that you take, for example, insect wing itself and do a process called atomic layer deposition and then you deposit over that you can get the structure is suitable for one dimensional structure and then you burn the insect wing and then you get your structure which is created based on the template and then these structures are in a way inverted of the actual structure but they display same color 
Thank you, yes. sir. Uh, another question, sir, raised by Shobha N. Uh, can we synthesize these nanostructures in the lab and which are the methods that can be used? Yes, I, I just answered this question previously, yes. right? Uh, yeah, yes, I sir. think that's the okay. answer. And go to the next question, sir, uh, by Mayuri. Uh, what image processing can be applied to study these structures? Uh, image processing. So it, it depends. There is a big scope. Um, if you are looking at uh, the color or um, uh, or the nanostructures, um, uh, there are a huge way. Like any imaging technique can be used depending on your convenience. Starting photography up to confocal, polarized optical microscope, just I saw polarized vision, and uh, depending what you actually want to use. But for processing by itself, I don't know um, if this question can be clarified, whether you want to identify the pattern uh, using an image, or you want to construct something from the image. Okay, sir. Uh, the next question is, sir, uh, by the same uh, participant, how is pigments and uh, RI adsorption coefficient related? Pigment. Okay, yeah, yeah. I I had a slide which I did not actually use for this um, um, because if you take um, in uh, refractive index based materials. And uh, it depends on the difference in the refractive index between the two material, right? Then if the difference between the two material is very large, then you need a few number of layers, for example, to achieve the same thing. If the difference in the refractive index is very low between two uh, layers, I mean like the two material, like for example, water and air is uh, slightly high. And if you take, for example, cellulose and water, they have very small difference. Then you need large number of layers to achieve the same color. But uh, pigments, uh, um, sometimes most of the colors are not only for because of pigments or only because of structures. I would like to clarify this is a big combination of more than one type. It can be pigment alone it can be structural color on but often it's a combination of pigments and structural color and i cannot give you the exact answer for this the first one okay sir uh, so this question has been raised by uh, Clavian. uh whether this fundamental science can be utilized in quality assurance yeah so there are a lot of things that can this color change has been used for example uh, sensing humidity and sensing chemical vapors and uh, vapor chromic sensors that's exactly the idea of knowing these structures you know how the this works and uh, also you can do actually yes that, that is uh, for example if you have a food it has to be maintained in certain you know temperature and humidity you can have these kind of things if the color is changing, it means that it's a bad quality. For example, if it's responsible for humidity or it, it secretes some other things. So this is uh, quality control or quality assurance is one of the applications for this uh, color changing materials, which are very sensitive actually. Thank you, sir. So this is the last question. Uh, what are the applications of 3D photonics? Three dimensional photonics, um, which, for example, I gave this example of uh, beetles. I think 3D photonics, uh, um, uh, one of the applications is already I told you, like um, how to modulate light, right? And um, it's not only about the color. And one idea here is that we have uh, pigments. We don't have pigments. And when we have pigments, you can still trap the light you can modulate the light and you can propagate the light, which means that they find a big application in desensitized solar cells where the absorption coefficient is very low and they undergo degradation. They cannot do efficiently trap the light. 
So that's where the, these kinds of application comes in. If you have seen in the 1987 paper by Sajiv John, this is exactly what he pointed out. Where it will see a big application is that where we need to trap more light, but without using pigments. So that dramatically increases the efficiency of, uh, say, solar cells. Thank you, but sir. There will be more applications. Of course, the literature is full of applications, and you are free, free to, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you for enlightening us with your words and clarifying all the queries. It was indeed a wonderful session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. So, uh, could you share your email ID with our participants, sir, if they want to reach out to you? Yes, yeah, sure. I think that's already in the slide and um, um, uh, it can be, yes. Okay, sir. Thanks a lot, sir. A thankful heart is a happy heart. We are happy and fortunate today to hear the talk from Dr. Nonapa. It was an illuminating session that has made us all grateful beyond words. You have truly inspired us, sir, with your expertise. Our heartfelt thanks to you for taking time to deliver this talk. It was an honor to have you with us. Thank you very much, sir. It is my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. My sincere thanks goes to the college management, our beloved director, Reverend Father Wilfred Prakash de Souza, Assistant Directors, Reverend Father Rohit de Costa and Reverend Father Alvin de Souza for their unconditional support in all our endeavors. My heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed principal, Dr. Rio de Souza, for his encouragement and support in organizing this webinar. My special thanks to our dynamic editor, Dr. K. Jyoti, for diligently working and executing this webinar. Thank you, ma'am. I thank wholeheartedly the teaching and non-teaching staff of chemistry department for their unwavering support. My sincere thanks to the press and media group of SJAC, particularly Mr. Ragesh Raju for the logistic support. I thank the SJAC family for being supportive always in every way. Last but not the least, a big thank you to all our wonderful participants for your active participation in the webinar. You're the reason for us to strive more and do better. Thank you, one and all. We have now come to the end of the webinar. Kindly fill up the feedback forms if you all haven't. It has been posted in the chat box. Participant, please fill up the feedback forms as you will receive the certificates only if you fill up the feedback forms. You will receive them within three to three days to one week. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe and have a great day. This is Pramila de Souza signing off. Thank you.